It's the 1980s. On a cold winter night somewhere in suburban Scotland, a young girl is watching one of those typical American movies she adores. She loves the perfect suburban landscapes in these films, a white picket fence that surrounds luscious lawns. It almost looks utopian to her from her dreary gray town where it seems dreams can't be realized like they can in the US of A. Two decades later, she's living in suburban Orange County, California, trying to claim a slice of the American dream. She hasn't seen much to shout about yet. Her life is more like an American nightmare. It sucks. Everything sucks. What's happened here? Every day this woman regrets that she sold her house in Bonnie, Scotland and laid a bet on being content in American suburbia. The kind of place where she now lives had looked to her as a child like an idol designed in town planning heaven. But the stark reality is it was forged in the offices of land management hell. It's complicated, so today we'll try to paint a complete picture for you from start to finish. Let's begin with a huge part of the American pie people can't seemingly live without – the car. Or in the case of many suburbanite American families, the two cars plus the fuel-guzzling, environment-hating, pedestrian-bashing sports utility vehicle. Americans just love big. But big, dear viewers, is not always better. The car is important in the US, dare we say more important than it is in other countries. It's not only a symbol of what people want to project to the world, but it represents the individualism many Americans are so proud of. Catch a bus, says a typical American guy, I might as well tattoo sucker on my head in capital letters. A lot of Americans adore their cars. To take them away, you'd have to pull them from their cold, dead hands. We are generalizing, of course, but the car is an important aspect of American life. Just look at all the movies about cars and car worship, possessed cars, making out in the back of cars, and the fast and furious conspicuous consumption of cars and trucks we trust. Amen to automobiles. We hold this truth to be evident that all Americans love their right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of a turbocharged, fuel-injected, bad-to-the-bone combustion engine. But it's not just a matter of individualism, style, or freedom on the highway. It's also because the majority of Americans wouldn't be able to get anywhere without them. The first thing the woman in the intro noticed when she moved to Orange County is that if you intend to spend your life on foot there, you might as well move to the Sahara Desert. Okay, so that's an exaggeration, but seriously, in much of American suburbia, you can't get anywhere without the help of a two- or four-wheeled machine. The U.S. suburbs are sometimes called car-centric. They were designed for cars, not feet. So if you live there, you might find you are car-dependent. Maybe some Americans are watching this right now and thinking, yeah, sure, I'm car-dependent. You just haven't been to 12-step meetings about it. Hey, uh, my name is Joe, and I'm dependent on my car. It's not your fault. That's life. So what? Well, we hate to tell you this. This isn't life for the rest of the world. There are around 276 million vehicles in the US, but those are the ones that are registered. There are many more on top of that. For the 331.9 million people that live in the US, there are 746.4 million people living in the EU, but only about 250 million registered vehicles in the EU. These numbers might change a bit depending on the source, but wherever you look, you see that Americans seem to have a lot of cars. For instance, the US Department of Transportation said lately, the average number of cars owned per household is about 1.88. The European Union says that for every 1,000 EU households, there are about 600 cars. You do have cities such as New York where not owning a car might not ruin your lifestyle so much, but New York is an outlier in the US in terms of getting around easily. And anyway, moving into the suburbs farther out of the city and getting around on foot will be about as convenient as practicing Christianity in North Korea, but maybe slightly less dangerous. Ok, excuse us for adopting hyperbole again, but it's true to some extent. Americans, for the most part, really need their cars. Again, it's not just because they all desperately want cars. The places they live have been especially designed for cars, whereas in much of Europe, the cities and suburbs have been designed for people's convenience. You can step out of your suburban house or apartment and walk a very short distance to a train station or a bus stop or a tram stop or you can use one of the mini bicycle lanes. Don't say the US is too big for this. We'll show you why it's not true soon. Our woman in the intro would wait for a bus for so long in Orange County that she'd take nail clippers to the bus stop. Her friend who lives outside of Arlington in Texas said there's so little public transport where she lives, people think they've seen a UFO when they finally set their eyes on a bus or a train. Alright, we exaggerate again, but it's true. In Arlington and many other places in the US, there is no access or no easy access to buses and trains. We mean none at all. Nada. Not a sniff. This is virtually unheard of in Europe, unless you live somewhere like the wildest parts of the Scottish Highlands or in godforsaken northern Sweden. 
And let's face it, not many people live in such areas. Like Santa, you might need to get around on a reindeer-pulled sleigh that far up north. Still, a friend of the infographic show recently told us, I currently live in the northernmost part of Norway, and even here the public transit is better than the American suburbs. But where there are lots of people in Europe, you will find public transport on your doorstep. You will be spoiled for choice. In many parts of the US, there isn't much on the doorstep. And if you walk a while, you reach bigger roads that take you to other roads. And if you walk down those for a while, perhaps getting funny looks from all the shocked car drivers who think you're mad or up to no good, you might reach a strip mall where you can at least get a drink to satiate your now raging thirst. Walk on, and you will likely reach a highway or a giant nexus of highways. And if you try to walk or even cycle down those, you might well end up in jail or the local asylum. This could be an exaggeration, but it also might not be. With all these US cars, if you use a bicycle, you can be sure you'll breathe more pollution than you would in many European suburbs. Sometimes you'd also be taking your life into your own hands. We aren't talking about the BMX bandits of the 80s scooting around small streets. We're talking about actually using a bicycle as a means of productive transportation. It's normal in much of Europe. It's cool. You should try it. It looks and feels great. The US just wasn't designed for this. For instance, drive throughs are everywhere in the US, and we aren't just talking about Big Macs and heart attack shakes. They've got those in Europe, to a much lesser extent. People in the US even watch movies in their cars at drive-ins. Normal for you, but totally weird for many Europeans. Since cars are the a la mode, the mode of transport, you can often find bank drive throughs liquor store drive throughs vaccine drive throughs we aren't kidding, and Walmart curbside services. What next? drive through funerals? drive through weddings? Oh, oh, wait, that's a thing already. Also, in the US, it's quite normal to see people driving a vehicle inside the supermarket. These people, for the most part, have become too big to walk. One guy writing on a forum said the new things he'd seen were drive-up service for food banks. These saviors for the very poor are sometimes called drive through food pantries. Sure, the austerity ailed UK has a rising number of food banks, but try driving through them and you'll end up with human guts on your windscreen. Many of the poor folks in the UK can't afford a car to take them to get their free can of Tesco value baked beans and a loaf of cheap white bread. This brings us to something else. Not only is it easier to get a cheap set of wheels in the US than Europe, but the gasoline that powers things is way cheaper in the US. In the UK, where cars are expensive, gas is much more expensive than the US. There are good reasons for this. It's supposed to make you live a certain way. In fact, because of high taxes, European gas pretty much everywhere is much more expensive than in the US, not including Russia. The main reasons for the high taxes on fuel is to get people to use their motor vehicles less. It's worked. There's far less congestion on European streets than in many parts of the US, and Europeans are more likely to buy fuel-efficient cars. As we write this show, one liter of gas in the US costs about $1.05. The same amount in Poland will set you back $1.44. In Germany, it's $1.86. In the UK, it's $1.91. In Greece, it's $2.01. Iceland is the most expensive in Europe and almost the world at $2.23 a liter. Cheap cars, cheap gas, you might think it's great, but it's not really. It would be better if you could hop on a cheap public transport and live somewhere that's pretty and doesn't smell like the inside of an overworked muffler or an exhaust pipe to some of you. Americans might also say that they love the fact that there are so many parking spaces for them. On average, for every US car, there are 3.4 spaces. Try parking a car in various parts of London. You'll either need to take out a loan or drive around for so long that you'll forget why you wanted to park in the first place. Parking spaces in the UK are so rare, people will literally kill you for them. That might sound bad, but it's better on the whole. In the British suburbs, even where anyone can legally park on a street, Using up a homeowner's parking space is very taboo. We are exaggerating a bit again, but we have a point. The US wants you to drive so parking spaces are made available. It makes the suburbs the land of cars and car spaces, which is not very nice to look at or live in. All right, to some of you, you're now saying, well, the US is so much bigger than Europe. We couldn't build public transport infrastructure that Europe has. Actually, in terms of size, Europe and the US are almost equal. Europe has just built its cities better. It has connected people better. Collectively, it has twice as many people as the US, but far less congestion and far more public transport connections. The cities, their suburbs, and the countries in general have been planned to help people get around. The US hasn't bothered with that. It's not about construction difficulties, it's about lack of political will, car culture, and to some extent the automobile industry. In Europe, trains go almost everywhere. 
while the US rail system is terrible for a wealthy nation. Trains are a part of most Europeans' lives. They're essential for living for many people. For Europeans traveling long journeys on a Greyhound bus with a grinning guy next to you drinking from a plastic liter bottle of $7 vodka should warrant a human's right abuse investigation. Kidding. Almost. The train maps of Europe look like the arteries and veins of the human body, while the US train maps look like a two-year-old boy got bored trying to draw a T-Rex with a thick crayon. You half expect to get on an American train and find some guy with a rollie in his mouth and a banjo in his hands singing a song about breaking rocks in the prison gang. It's that outdated. While in Europe, modern trains get you everywhere at pretty much all times. Buses or bicycles can take you short distances and trains can take you long ones. Add this to the fact that you can travel without visas in the EU, minus Brexit Britain, and you can easily walk out of your house, get on a cheap bus and then board a cheap train and be sunning it up on a beach in another country in as much time as it takes a guy in the LA suburbs to get to his office not 30 kilometers away. Okay, some commutes are easier than others, but the worst ones in the US are hellish. Here's what one guy wrote on a forum after someone had complained about congestion in LA. I once lived in Long Beach and traveled 30 miles to a job in Wilshire. Taking the 405 was the most direct route and the fastest. I spent four hours minimum every day on the road not moving. This is what car dependence is doing to America, not to mention the pollution it creates. There should be infomercials on American TV right now showing people breaking down during their commutes. This is your brain on rush hour. Suburbs in Europe have also been built so people can do stuff in them. How unique. There are usually active communities where people interact. Kids are usually safe playing in them. Even the most hardcore suburban council estates in the UK are home to takeaway food restaurants and places nearby where one can enjoy oneself, even if many people's idea of enjoyment is placing a bet in one of the ubiquitous bookies. Yeah, it's not all ideal, but even with that downside, you find pubs that have been there sometimes for centuries that serve the community, hence the name Public House. The suburbs in the US, meanwhile, are often designed as a place to live and sleep and then commute to work in your car. They're not community or fun focused. In the US, you might need to go all the way to the city to find enough things to do. You don't need the city in Europe for the most part. The suburbs can be good enough and they are self-sustaining. They don't just break down, go rogue, collapse. Not so much in the US, where many suburbs don't seem to sustain much but widespread boredom. With their long tree-lined streets, the big gardens, the wide roads, and the fact that folks drive all the time on these roads, the US suburbs aren't cheap to run. If you're poorer and live in some of the suburbs that look so neglected, the streets are virtually crying out for a hug. Things are much worse. These places have gone to hell in a handbasket. Lack of maintenance means a once bright idea now looks ripe for a Hollywood dystopian movie. In many of the worst case scenario US suburbs, there are only shells of houses on some streets where families used to sit in charming dining rooms eating Thanksgiving dinner. Now disenfranchised folks huddle below smashed bedroom windows wondering how they'll get their next score. We have mentioned drugs a few times and you'll see why at the end. It's a truly sorry sight to behold, but it's happened in many places in the US. Sure, as we said, there are some pretty dodgy rundown areas in suburban Europe. Not everyone lives like a middle-class Dutch family that gets around on multi-seated bicycles and has no idea what it's like to pawn your furniture for food. In the UK's toughest suburbs, just about all the bicycles have been stolen and fenced at least three times, and getting on a bus late at night could mean a fast introduction to knife crime. But still, at least there are buses. At least there's something to do to merit a bus journey. Also, the streets might look run down, but they aren't as bad as the USA's post-apocalypse suburbia. The worst of America resembles Dresden after the Brits and Americans bombed the hell out of it in World War II. Something unique has happened to these really run-down US suburbs. They are dark, strange places. It's hard to believe they belong to the richest country in the world. Maybe right now someone in a crime-infested Venezuelan barrio is thinking, those poor, unfortunate American suburbanites, life must be so hard for them. He then sees an ad on TV. It says you can help out an American family living in poverty for just $1 a month. The guy writes down the website address. This brings us to something else, what has been called the Great American Suburban Ponzi Scheme. How did so much of the US get so run down so fast? We guess you know what a Ponzi Scheme is. If you don't, here it goes. Create a fake investment. Get initial investors to invest. Pay those investors with new investors money. It'll sustain itself for a while, but in the end you aren't making any real profit, so the entire scheme will go bust when everyone asks for their cash or investment back. Years ago, the US started its great suburban experiment, which was kind of a Ponzi scheme. 
Those rundown places you see now were once wonderful pleasant fills, but they could never pay for themselves. Still, families flocked to these places, quickly erecting a white picket fence and putting two cars in the driveway. More and more Americans wanted a piece of spaciously sublime suburbia. Many left the cities or the countryside in search of suburban bliss. The sprawling suburbs sprawled some more. And some more, and some more, more houses had to be built, more roads had to be built since those places were never intended to serve non-car families. They weren't diverse like the European suburbs, though. They didn't have lots of things going on – businesses, clubs, community events, etc. People just lived there, watered their lawns on the weekend, and drove to work from there every day. If there was a hive of activity, it was mostly gossip. Nothing happened there, so these places did not create much tax revenue. They didn't pay for themselves, as the European ones did. As one expert on this matter wrote, North American development patterns sacrificed adaptability, expandability, and financial productivity. Our development pattern became, in a word, fragile. When you have an assembly line of neighborhoods but no proper economic growth, something will go wrong. There will be a crash at some point, just like in a Ponzi scheme. With low tax revenues coming from these places, planners build more houses to get more taxes from them. But more housing developments only delay the pain that will surely come. The taxes paid by people aren't enough when serious maintenance needs to happen. The suburbs themselves don't make much money. And building more of them, getting more investors in on the scheme, will mean higher maintenance costs. Eventually, the money will run out. The less maintenance that happens, the less attractive the places become, the beauty starts to take the form of the beast. Those with enough money move out, and those without money move in put up with the crumbling houses around them, and those white picket fences and manicured gardens start looking like a pile of bones lying in a half-built graveyard. These people who have been sold a dream of eternal growth, of everlasting beauty, when the reality of where they lived was more like Oscar Wilde's brilliant novel The Picture of Dorian Gray. That same website we just mentioned called Strong Towns explained, in America we have a ticking time bomb of unfunded liability for infrastructure maintenance. The American Society of Civil Engineers ASCE, estimates the cost at $5 trillion, but that's just for major infrastructure, not the minor streets, curbs, walks, and pipes that serve our homes. This doesn't mean that all of the USA is suffering from sprawlcalypse. Many places are well-maintained, but a lot aren't. As any ancient Greek scholar might have told you, such hubris usually comes before a fall. More houses get built and more people move in. It looks great for a while until there's no money to fix things. Sometimes a municipality borrows money, and as you've seen, that can result in it going totally broke. These US suburbs are sometimes not smart. While the European ones, despite some of them looking rather grim, seem smart enough not to fall into the trap of becoming a biblical hellscape. Such a hellscape in America was just portrayed to good effect in the horror movie Barbarian. Sure, that's just the movies, but the rundown neighborhood in the film is supposed to represent this fairly new phenomenon of American suburban horror. Even if you live in one of the better suburbs, you'll still probably have to put up with all that congestion and the fact that it's not that much fun on its own. It's more like a factory farm, and you're a cow who was just fooled and told that rolling green meadows were old-fashioned. If you don't believe us, just look at forums where scores of Americans talk about how the suburbs are ugly and depressing. Nonetheless, Rome wasn't built in a day, so don't feel so bad if you're stuck in a place that reminds you of the play Jean-Paul Sartre wrote about hell, called No Exit. You might not be able to change the fact that you're surrounded by highways that wrap around you like venomous snakes, but you can be part of the solution to transform your suburb. It doesn't always have to be what some US media have called soul-crushing. Suburbs can be redesigned for humans, not just cars. They can connect people to places of interest, not just places of spending. It'll take the will of governance and the public, although it is obvious that the suburban areas that have been forsaken for too long need to be completely overhauled. Now you must watch this classic, Average American vs. Average European. How do they compare? People comparison. Or take a look at an alternative reality in Hitler's plans for the world if he won.